Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third Australian Water Safety Council uh, webinar, uh, the third in the series. Um, today, we've got a really exciting uh, program for you. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, uh, the Kamaraigal people uh, on the land in which I'm sitting today. And I'd encourage you to ponder and reflect on the traditional owners in which um, in the area that you're uh, joining this webinar from. I acknowledge their uh, elders past, present and future. And as uh, most of you know, Royal Life Saving is committed to a reconciliation action plan and absolutely committed to uh, finding uh, new ways to partner with Aboriginal Torres Strait Island the people across the country. Um, this webinar series uh, has been really lots of fun and we're getting lots of fantastic feedback. Um, I'd like to encourage you to use the chat function and also the Q&A. Um, you will notice that, um, uh, that some of the Royal Lifesaving team are also dropping links throughout uh, the webinar uh, that will take you to, to some wonderful places, some information, some research, some program links. Um, and that's sort of a good way as we're talking for you to, uh, rather than uh, looking at Sydney Morning Herald at the latest COVID news, but actually go in and drill into some water safety and drowning prevention information. So uh, people have really appreciated the chat function. So use that. Um, use the chat function also to introduce yourself. It's, uh, I can see there's probably around 50 people today. We did get to 100 last time. So hopefully that number will climb as people uh, start joining, but use the chat function to also introduce yourself and who you are, where you're from and what you like uh, doing within the drowning prevention space. Um, that's a good way to, for people to, to connect with you as well. So I'd encourage you to do that. And also don't forget the Q&A uh, section of Zoom as well, where we'll post some questions and you can post some questions and also add to those questions uh, if it's something that you would like uh, us to address uh, during the webinar. Um, all right, so today is, uh, is really, a, I think it's the third in the series. Um, as you know, um, for the last two, we've very much focused on specific areas of the Australian Water Safety Strategy. The first webinar series focused on, um, on people and populations. Um, and the second one focused on activities and places. Uh, today's a little bit different. What we're going to do is, uh, is have a look at a range of voices from the global and regional perspective of drowning prevention. We're then going to spend a little bit of time looking at how state and territories might engage with the Australian water safety strategy. Uh, we're then going to bring it up to the local government area. I say up because in many respects, um, local government is, is the biggest investor and contributor to drowning prevention in Australia. I think we do underestimate that at times. So uh, we're going to talk to two people that are working within local government about how they're going about addressing local water safety issues. Um, and then finally, we're going to have a deep dive into um, some programs. Um, programs are a really wonderful, vibrant space. There's some fantastic things going on in that area. So we've got two really good examples of people doing great things in their local communities. Um, so let's make a start. Um, everyone's uh, familiar. We don't know what to call this, but, um, you know, informally we're calling it the pinwheel. Um, it's actually, a, you know, a drowning prevention framework of sorts, and it's something that helps us to navigate the Australian water safety strategy. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time focusing on how this pinwheel might be customised and tailored to those three levels, the state and territory level, the local government level, but also increasingly at a program level. We really would encourage everyone to engage with this pinwheel in some way um, because it will take a lot of local effort in order to achieve the objectives from the Australian Water Safety Strategy. Um, but probably enough from me, let's get started. Um, I'd like to, with great pleasure, introduce two wonderful uh, speakers uh, this morning, Dr. Caroline Lukasik and also uh, Dr. Jagnor Jagnor. Caroline's from the World Health Organization and Dr. Jagnor is from uh, the George Institute for Global Health. So welcome to you both. Hi. Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, <laughs> Great to be here. Caroline. Uh, good morning, Jagnor. Oh, good morning, everyone. I think actually we just clicked over to, to good afternoon, but uh, afternoon, yeah. Caroline, you've you've You've, you've given it away. You're actually in Sydney. Perhaps we could start with, uh, with you introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about, um, you know, where you come from and, and how you came, found yourself in the drowning prevention space. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Justin. Um, so again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caroline Lucas. As Justin's mentioned, I work for the World Health Organization. And I'm a technical officer for violence, injury and alcohol at the Western Pacific Regional Office. So usually I'm actually sitting in Manila in the Philippines. And as Justin has alluded to, I'm very happy to be back in Australia. I'm visiting friends and family for the next couple of months. Um, but I think 
the way I've really got here is it's quite interesting. And, and I'm very lucky also to have Jack Noor, who is a, a long-term um, colleague and mentor as well on this call, um, who really got me involved in drowning prevention uh, when I was still heavily involved in research through the George Institute of Global Health. And I so I started off having quite a broader interest in injury prevention and violence prevention. Um, I think especially once traveling, doing a lot of field work, really understanding how much people, especially in the income countries, live around water bodies, rely on water bodies for, for food, for work, for transport. Uh, it really contextualizes why drowning is such a huge issue uh, within the Western Pacific and Southeast Asian regions which I'm primarily working right now. So I hope that's a good intro, Justin. Absolutely. I do think drowning prevention is infectious. So I'd, I'd really love to hear when we've converted people from injury prevention, particularly into the drowning prevention family. Um, Dr. Jagno, you're another convert. So how about you introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background? Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm not committing to any conversion at the moment. It doesn't go very well in the political space that I, I often hear about. So no commitments as yet, non-committal. Lovely to see you too, Caroline, um, and welcome back. Uh, so I am um, I am a senior research fellow at the Joint Institute for Global Health, and I co-direct the Wilson Collaborative Centre for Injury Prevention and Trauma Control. Um, my sphere of work, I think, uh, like Caroline, I started with verbal autopsy and my major interest was methodologies and then kind of moved into specialization in injuries. And I work globally, so I like to call myself a global health researcher with a specific interest in injuries. And yes, a lot of people find very hard and, and perhaps successful to most, most of the extent, uh, given the lovely personalities there are in the drowning field. So happy to be here and looking forward to listening from everyone. On that note, actually, just a moment, uh, just then I saw Flop was online as well. And as much as drowning excites me, I think I'm more excited by um, the stretches that Floss has been making us do when we are not virtually on. So I look forward to some <laughs> of those on recording, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It does does take us back to the to the workshop where the Australian Water Safety Strategy came from, which is way back now in 2019 pre-COVID, where we had uh, Carolyn and Jagnor participating. Um, I guess there's some people sort of scratching their head, wondering if this is if this is the Australian Water Safety Strategy. Why do we have two global health experts on the call? Um, I think there's many of you that have seen, uh, but some of you are perhaps not aware specifically. Um, that in April, the, the United Nations declared its very first global resolution on drowning prevention. Um, and so we thought this would be a really great opportunity to talk to Carolyn and Jagnall just about the regional and global perspective in which we, uh, we interact and intersect. So um, that's the, what we're going to do for the next little while is talk about what's going on in the region, what drowning looks like in our nearest neighbours and what that might mean for drowning prevention uh, globally, but also you know, contextually in Australia. I think we'd like to start just with a short video. This video has been seen by some of you, but perhaps not all of you. This is a video from the UN General Assembly from just a few uh, months ago in April, weeks ago in April. Mr. President, in the last decade alone, more than 2.5 million lives were lost to the water, needlessly. Infants slipping silently into ponds, fathers never returning from fishing trips, sisters submerged on their way to school, wasted lives and preventable deaths on an epidemic scale. Drowning is a major and neglected cause of global mortality. 235,000 lives lost every year, 650 every day, 26 every hour. Astounding, staggering figures. Annually, a greater loss of life than to maternal mortality and malnutrition. It is an issue without geographical borders and boundaries. Anyone, anywhere can drown. It affects every nation of the world and some more dramatically and inequitably than others. Over 90% of deaths occur in low and middle income countries. The highest rates recorded in Africa and the greatest numbers across Asia, with children and young people representing the majority of lives lost, our future. Despite its global burden. 
that's just a, a vignette from a speech that was um, really quite inspiring and empowering from the ambassador from Bangladesh. Um, Carol, 90% of drowning occurs in low and middle income countries, most of those across Asia. You're working in Asia. Tell us all about what's happening and what you understand the burden of drowning to be in our nearest neighbourhood. Well, I think uh, this might actually be a very good opportunity for a quick plug about an upcoming uh, bi-regional product being released by the World Health Organization. Um, it's been released on the 22nd of July, and it's really a series of two reports that highlight the burden of drowning in the context of drowning in the Southeast Asian and Western Pacific regions. Um, to get to these reports, we've been doing a lot of work. It's been over two years now of traveling across the region, really trying to understand what is happening on the ground and why we're seeing these, these numbers reported. Um, so I think uh, what I can very confidently report is that it's been a huge learning experience for us. We've really understood the, 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 the broad context of drowning across the region. Of course, the region I work across is very diverse, being from China, Mongolia, all the way down to Australia, New Zealand, coming across the entire Pacific and a couple of new Kong countries as well. And again, I sort of alluded to this in my previous comments, but sort of understanding the, the, uh, the extremity of, of, of contact we have with water, especially in low income countries. Uh, again, a lot of people rely on water for livelihoods, for fishing, for uh, other, other water-based activities, transport again, so especially in the Pacific Island countries like Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. Uh, small boats used to travel very, very large distances over water, often very unsafe conditions, often in, in, in un, untrained uh, people and captains uh, navigating the water. So again, you sort of really start to understand the complexity around addressing this issue and you see how many different sectors and stakeholders are actually needing to be engaged to make these broader policy changes and broader programs uh, to really help keep people, communities and families safe around the world. Um, Dr. Jagnall, you, your work tracks across um, several countries, Vietnam, Bangladesh and India. What does drowning look like from your perspective in those countries? Uh, I will just resonate what Caroline was just saying that it is dynamic and it's complex across. Uh, perhaps we are more talking more about child injuries when we are limiting ourselves to these uh, child drowning, particularly when we are limiting ourselves to these three countries. But even within these contexts, the, 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 the risk and uh, the complexity with geographical disparities becomes really big. And as we talk about drowning, it's, it's also important to understand that that, is, that might or might not be a political or community priority. And then talking about the WHO or the global agenda languages and something that even um, uh, Dr. Ravel was reflecting on, it becomes about social determinants, commercial determinants, as well as environmental determinants across these countries. And so to me, that is the reflection and the intersection that happens all along. And just to be clear, when I talk about social determinants, I'm not talking about socioeconomic inequities, uh, another thing that we heard about in the vineyard, but I'm talking about the longitudinal, intersectional, accumulated uh, inequities that contribute towards the drawing burden. So to me, that is a common learning across three contexts, that irrespective of where you are and what your exposure is or what your activity is, uh, there are underlying determinants that influence your risk and exposure and the outcome for drowning. Right. Um, Carolyn, you, you, um, like you, you haven't alluded to, you've gone straight to the plug, right? Um, you, you've, that's really good media training. And when, when Royal Life Saving, we get our team together to talk about media training, you know, one of the objectives is get the plug in and get it in early because you never know what the moderator facilitator is going to ask you. Um, but, but so these, these reports are being launched. There is a date now. I think it's the 23rd, 24th, somewhere around that, a few days before the World Drowning Prevention Day, which is fantastic. Um, can you give us um, one or two of the surprises? Something sure, you've absolutely. learned that you didn't quite expect. Absolutely. So first of all, Justin, I will correct you, 22nd of July is the launch date. Okay. And perhaps a good way to sort of circulate this is invite would be to maybe see an email list of our participants to today's event and maybe we can share it that way as well. It would be fantastic to make sure everyone has the opportunity to learn about these great resources. Um, so some surprises from these reports. I think what is a little bit different about these, and I hope everyone really appreciate, 
is the amount of case studies and personal stories we have included in these reports. So I think one really incredible um, opportunity we had while traveling and understanding sort of uh, the burden and the context of drowning about what happens and why it's happening is the fantastic innovative solutions are really being driven by not only the high, high level government, but also community based solutions. And the fantastic partners and stakeholders we have on the ground are already doing so much work on this agenda and may not always feel supported or connected to a broader community also working in this space. So to try and really highlight this, we've brought together a lot of case studies and stories and quotes and personal reflections from stakeholders across both regions. So I think that would be a very interesting component of the reports for people to, to review. Um, and also, I think at the very back of the report as well, I'm not sure if other people on the call are familiar with WHO status reports, we do have country profiles. So each country in both regions has a snapshot, a one page snapshot that highlights the sort of progress made or the efforts made towards addressing drowning at the national level. And as this is the first report of this type that we're developing, we're hoping this will be a baseline. So countries will be able to reflect and look at exactly where they currently are with giant prevention measures and understand, hold on, there's more areas that we can, we can make further progress on. And again, these reports can then be used as a tool to monitor progress over time and see, see how much progress is made in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So this is, these are real hopes for the reports. This is something that's exciting about them. Um, so the other thing we do in media training is we remind people that in a live interview, when the moderator asks a question, you get to answer whatever question you want. So you've doubled down on the plug. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go triple. Like on the third, I think on the 22nd or 23rd, there's also a webinar that people can, um, can dial into. Um, and if you really uh, have enjoyed listening to Carolyn talk about the regional context, there's lots of opportunities to engage. Um, this is one of the areas that globally, I think, um, is, is growing very, very rapidly and, and Australians can be proud of the contribution they've made. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to give you an opportunity to talk about the two or three surprises now that you found in the report. It seems to me like we're going to have to wait to see those reports. And I, I do think that um, I do think the case study vignette approach will be really uh, quite inspiring. Um, Jagnall, can I ask you, you, you were involved in the, work, the workshop um, for the Australian Water Safety Strategy and given your expansive uh, work across the region. Um, do you think there's any crossover between what's happening regionally and what needs to happen in Australia? Oh, good question. I think, um, I think the recipe to success is kind of universal. So it boils down to four things. That is good governance, strong partnerships, dedicated capacity and resources and evidence and evaluation. And as Caroline plugged in the bi-regional WHO report, I think that's a great best baseline to start um, thinking about accountability measures. And also reflecting again on what Caroline was just saying and hoping to listen more about what's happening at the community level in Australia is the fact that um, we can talk about intersections and intersections between sectors and share goals. Uh, but if we don't speak the same language and we don't have a good understanding of our shared goals or the core cool benefits that various actors, players at different levels bring in, it is kind of a missed opportunity. And um, mm. so, yeah, I think uh, that, that is a common uh, challenge across global as well as local work that we all are keen. And it's interesting, uh, the people in global health field would often say global health is actually local health. So maybe I should be more intrigued and um, uh, engrossed in what's happening in my backyard. <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, accountability is is a good a good point. partnership. I think we'll find uh, today, particularly, we'll talk a lot about partnerships. I think that comes out strongly. Accountability is one of those areas that I think is challenging for us at an Australian Water Safety Council Water Safety Strategy level. I think um, this is very much a document of influence. Um, we were, you know, forty five people contributed to the strategy directly and indirectly. Organisations were involved, um, but we don't control a lot. Um, but we certainly collaborate and influence some of the outcomes. So, but I do think increasingly that accountability conversation is going to be really important as we progress uh, development of, uh, of this opportunity arising from the, the UN resolution. Um, there, were, there was another video, but we're not going to show it. We might drop it into the link in some way so people can reflect. That video goes to the Bangladesh context uh, locally and what interventions look like. But we're you going to wrap this session up. Oh. We were going to go to it, but we're not now. Um, we're going to wrap the session up. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Caroline, Dr. Jagnor. It's been great spending some time with you. Thank you very much. And we'll talk again very soon. 
Thanks so much, Justin. Thank you. Thanks, Jagnall. Thank you. Um, okay, moving right along. Um, so just going back to, we need a name for this. Uh, some people are calling it the framework, the drowning prevention framework. Uh, some people are calling it the pinwheel. Um, but I think you all, all get it. We've, we've looked at this a couple of times over the webinar series. Uh, we divided drowning prevention or water safety objectives into five uh, areas. And within those five areas, the, the theory here was that we had to do a forced choice of the three most critical areas in each segment. So for places, we worked out that it was beaches, ocean, rock pools, um, and lakes and rivers, and also aquatic facilities. And, and for the others, it's pretty self-evident. Um, but we recognise that this is a national framework and that it may not necessarily work. Those choices may not apply in every state and territory or in every local government or in every community. So this is very much a framework. It's a menu. Um, it's some choices that need to be made. So that's a segue into our next speakers. Um, I'd like to, to welcome, while we focus on state and territory implementation, first of all, I'd like to welcome Floss Roberts, the Executive Director of Royal Life Saving Northern Territory, and Paul Shannon, the General Manager, Government and Industry Relations with Life Saving Victoria. Um, so let's start with you, Floss. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about uh, what uh, makes you tick and what you're working on. Oh, Justin, you said you was going to make Paul start first. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what makes me tick? Lots of things. But, um, you know, I, am, I work for Royal Life Saving in the Northern Territory and I just have the absolute privilege to lead a team of staff and volunteers and members um, who are just really committed to water safety across the whole Northern Territory. Um, and we just really believe in... Um, preventing drowning. So sometimes I call it water safety, sometimes I call it preventing drowning, depending on um, the audience. Uh, but we, we really have moved that to just creating positive experiences in people's lives because water safety doesn't sit around in a spot by itself. It's, it's a lifestyle. Um, it just sounds a bit boring to some people. So what makes me tick is making that exciting. Um, and, you know, um, doing that in the Northern Territory, it's always exciting. And on a side note, I've got three wonderful sons and a husband who are uh, wonderful men who love doing everything around fishing, boating and outdoor activities. So keeping them safe and, and that is really important to me too. Yeah, and a few, a few of them at least have featured in Royal Life Saving videos and photographs and annual reports and all sorts of things. It's always <laughs> handy to have... Uh, some models in the family. Thanks, Floss. Um, introducing you, Paul. Welcome, Paul. Um, again, just tell us a little bit about um, what uh, what you're interested in. Yeah, well, at, at the moment, um, I'm buried sort of neck deep in, in work while Floss is out boating and fishing and having a great time. Um, current, currently, I'm, I'm working on the Victorian Water Safety Strategy, which, which we're really sort of trying to model off the back of the Australian version um, and we've got quite a unique opportunity here in, in Victoria where, where um, we've got that, well, I'll go back. The last couple of strategies that we've actually put out, Life Saving Victoria have produced on behalf of the aquatic industry for government. Whereas the opportunity we've got at the moment is we're, we're partnering with government to pr produce a water safety strategy for community and the industry. So it's a little, little bit of, of a reversal to what we've had previously. So, so there's sort of a lot of collaborative work going on with you know, up, upwards of about 15 um, different um, entities within government, you know, trying to get each, each of those little touch points tied together to uh, be paddling in, in the upstream in the right direction. Um, Paul, so, so just to explain that model for us again, because I think this is a really key point. I think we all work hard to capture the attention of government and have get them focused on whether it's flosses, water safety or drowning, whatever the language is we use here. Yeah. Um, so this, this approach is different from the previous approach in that um, are we talking cross-government or are we talking whole of society, including other NGOs? Um, we, we're talking cross-government, but, but it is a a whole of entity um, piece of work, but being led by government um, and then Life Saving Victoria is bringing the aquatic industry to the table. So while it will be, um, you know, the engagement piece 
is with Lifesaver Victoria representing the industry and, and then the, the whole of Victorian government piece. Um, you know, so we've been lucky enough, well, unlucky in the, in the drowning numbers we've had in Victoria, but, it, but it's really, you know, raised the, the attention of, of, of government and the minister. And it, it's really been, you know, ministerial led that, that government needs to play a, a bigger part and, and is there a particular, like the other challenge for, for drowning is finding a home. Um, so at a ministerial level, where what's the home that you found in Victoria for drowning, for water safety, drowning prevention? Where's We're it being led from? It's being led by Emergency Management Victoria. Um, so so Lifesaving Victoria is partnering with Emergency Management Victoria as the, um, the agency that will pull it all together across government um, to deliver on, on what the strategy strategy looks like. So, um, and that that tying it to a particular area in government, I think, is the absolute key um, to success in this area. And and right down from a state government level to a regional to a municipal um, level is, is absolutely critical to to keep you know drowning front of mind. You know, right through the different tiers of government. Mm. Floss, how, how is um, water safety in the territory managed from a coordination and interface with government perspective? Well, um, we have, you know, from a drowning perspective, we've always maintained the, the highest drowning rate per capita across Australia. So, you know, people in the territory are, you know, four times more likely to drown than um, any other state and territory. So we have some unique challenges. So, you know, in 2002, the government um, launched a five point water safety plan. Um, it came out of the Labor government and Claire Martin at the time and established the Water Safety Advisory Council. So there's 16 members in the council across government and non-government um, organisations and appointment to that council is through a ministerial appointment. And from that in 2003, the first water safety plan was launched um, and that was across, you know, five key areas as well. Um, but, and this one now we'll be going into 2022 as our fifth water safety strategy across the Northern Territory. And I had a, you know, in, when I started, it was like, well, it should belong to one government department. So, you know, I think it might have been within a portfolio that included local government at the time. And then it got changed to Sport and Rec. Um, and, it can, you know, you can try and just level it across one agency, but I've learned to actually be more understanding that it is definitely cross-government agencies. Um, and so the important part is that, you know, the chief minister of whatever the, um, government that's in continues to support the importance of the water safety strategy and also the government departments within that. And then how we work in collaboration to, you know, make a difference and try and prevent drowning um, is the critical point, how we convert that into action because I love a great strategy. There's nothing better than that. But if it doesn't convert to action and engagement and people don't put it into their lives, then I just don't feel good about that. Um, and, you know, it's really exciting that we can come together and look at the learnings over those five water safety strategies, but also where we're at now um, to go forward. And I suppose... I'm really um, grateful that the leadership in government has gone, okay, that was a Labor government thing, we're out, we're on this. They have stayed committed to water safety is important. So those underpinning um, principles are really important. Yeah, well said. I, I mean, I do think, um, well, you know, I don't think I know, um, highest rates of drowning in the territory, but I, I do think at an organisational level, territorians have to go further and harder to get to the community. Um, and I think the penetration of water safety across the NT community is much higher relative to some of the biggest states actually. So, you know, drowning rates are lower in a big state, but actually um, the, the contact points are also much, much lower. So, you, you know, credit to um, all of the work that your team do. But um, I, do, I do think what you've said there is really interesting that um, the water safety strategy has got to survive a change in government and it's also got to survive and work cross-party uh, cross 
sectoral in terms of government agencies. And so you must have some magic there. Is there a way to describe the magic that happens um, at, um, at a, where the rubber hits the ground in terms of the MT water safety plan? What's the thing that binds you all together and committed to that approach? Well, it's definitely not my magic because, you know, Justin, I'm a bit of a wild card. So sometimes, you know, I'm good. <laughs> bad. Must be book the barrow, is it? <laughs> yeah. um, but the magic really, to be honest, is the people like collaborations getting thrown on the table like it's gone out of fashion. But, you know, once again, if it's not genuine and, you know, people can't be honest and then talk about it, um, then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, and some things won't change or need to change slowly or develop a better understanding. So, you know, that, that group of people that come together in the Water Safety Advisory Council, I mean, we only meet four times a year. And I say only, I mean, that's, everybody's lives are busy, but when we're there, we're 100%, you know, checking in where we're at. You know, the reports go up to the minister who is, is leading us at that time. And, you know, at the moment we've got um, Kate Warden, who's just an absolute um, legend in understanding water safety and the importance of what it is to people's lives. And also those, um, you know, the most vulnerable people that may never have had, a you know, water safety growing up and all that sort of thing. So, you know, I think the magic is in the, the team coming together understanding the differences and then you know what are we going to do you know how are we going to get that started um you know and i'll give you an example so yeah i hope i don't throw myself in the fire on this one but you know i want <laughs> i want a sober skipper and i want um voting legislation and my sons and husbands don't like me for that and half of their friends don't either but believing in that saves lives around the water um, and on the water. And, you know, other organisations don't believe that because they're got doing other ways to be safe and, you know, all that sort of thing. So having the discussion in the group of where you're at, but also what the priorities are for the dis different organisations and how they can respect the differences um, and all work together for the one purpose is really important. Wow. Yeah, I, <laughs> I I do recall the you being caught in the middle in terms of you're very um, correct, and uh, and I don't think there's anyone on this webinar that wouldn't disagree um, with the notion that we've got to attack licensing and alcohol consumption in, in the boating fraternity. And I think in the territory, it's it's much more challenging for you culturally than it might be in a state like um, Victoria. Um, so Paul, um, as you uh, go into the planning of a new water safety strategy, you, you mentioned that you might. Um, leverage off the Australian water safety strategy. Have you thought about what that looks like and how you might do that? Um, at, at the moment, we're probably still still early stages, but with, with regards to you know breaking it down in, into the you know those five areas, in particular people and places, you know I, I think that's a going to, going to be sort of a key starting point. What comes after those two, um, you know, will be what is unique to Victoria, I think so. So we'll very, very much Victorianise the, the um, you know the, the the context of, of the Australian Water Safety Strategy. But and, and again, it's it's still up for debate whether, whether we use the same framework. But there is a, a strong lean, you know, to that at the moment. Mm. It's well, it's no longer a framework. It's uh, Richard Franklin is suggesting pinwheel, spin wheel, win wheel of drowning prevention. Wow. Water yeah. wheel, water safety wheel. Carolyn's talking water safety whirl. Uh, Jagnall's gone sunburst water safety wheel. wheel. Um, think, so there's I a lot the, of energy. Yeah, the challenge is to tie it to another wheel um, ah, because yes. it, it's, to, it's to, to get it to, to align to a, another framework that's going to be reviewed and renewed and looked at, um, you know, on, on a monthly annual cycle right down yes. to the local level that's going to make it actually... Um, yes. maintain its momentum um, yeah look that's right I, I do think we, we 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 did step back from an implementation plan um, probably because we recognize that this wheel uh, the strategy needs to influence a lot of players without necessarily organize overplaying our hand in terms of organizing so I, I do think if you can um, contextualize the strategy and come up with sort of an implementation framework that would be the next step that that will help us all um, 
good good point um floss we've got um we wanted to give people just a taste of how how the territory prioritizes key drowning issues that are localized so we've got a video of one of the campaigns you ran more recently Authorized by the Northern Territory Government, Darwin. Um, it's a um, it's a really powerful video. Can you tell us about how that how that came about? Yes, um, Justin. One of the the challenges we have in the Northern Territory, um, you know, we we really sort of had two seasons, wet season, dry season. Um, and in the wet season, we you know get phenomenal rains. So we have massive drains, big wide canals, so the water gets bucketed down and exit out um, quickly. So unfortunately, that looks like fun for people to be in. Um, and it's so hot in the January and, you know, those months. So, you know, it looks like fun. People, you know, jump in them. And obviously, some of them are full of rubbish and all sorts of things. So unfortunately, to get to that campaign, we've had um, several drownings of um, mainly young people, but also, uh, um, you know, an older person um, and in in the um, drains. So the Water Safety Council looked at it um, and back then the Water Safety Council was ministered totally by the um, Northern Territory Government. And so they looked at a way of what other um, tropical um, areas were doing and they purchased a, a, a program out of um, the Cairns Council and it was like frogs rock rap dancing and it was a song saying stay out of pipes and drains. Anyway, that was taken out through, you know, um, radio and media and stuff, and it got got a bit of leverage and water safety talks in schools. And then sadly, um, you know, there was there was other drowning from the drains, and so it came out from a, the government. One of the government minister, uh, minister at the time said, "Nah, that's it. I know." And the coronial inquest, like the parents thought that maybe it made it look like fun because it was a song and all that sort of stuff. So the minister at the time said, no, I want something hard hitting. I want to do this. And he set out and um, put in the additional funds to develop um, this. So, you know, it was filmed in with a GoPro and all that sort of thing to bring out um, this next one to really talk to um, be able to, to put that out to families and to share in the schools because obviously some of these drains are straight out from the schools where the children are walking home from school and all that sort of thing so um, that's where this one this one came to and also the city of Darwin and the city of Palmerston put sponsorship or put money towards this so that there's merchandise to go in there like caps and slap bands so they can really engage with the children to say, you know, to talk to them about and get their feedback around what, what, you know, what are these pipes and drains? Why don't you go swim in there? And uh, and taking that to the classroom and the community events. So, um, and you know, the the good news about that um, promotion is that it can go out to the communities in, you know, Catherine, Tennant Creek, Alice Springs, because everywhere we've got those those big drains and you can't sign and fence everything. So, you know, you can promote where it is safe to swim at and but then also share those messages out so that they can, um, we can try and really target an area to say, we, you know, we don't want any more children in those. We don't want to see them in there. And, you know, when you look at behaviour, like you used to see, you know, 
um, photos that kids all line up around different drains in the in the January um, school holidays, um, whereas now you really don't see too much of that. And, and it's a whole of community and families sharing that message as well to make the difference. Mm, yeah, a, a very powerful communication and the, back, the background is important because um, in some respects, uh, you know, one, one communication strategy doesn't necessarily apply across all contexts. And um, I do think there's a pressure, particularly with government's involvement on advertising and advertising approaches. Let's have a look at a Victorian advertising campaign um, and see what, 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 how they're looking at this in Victoria. Men over the age of 45 are at the highest risk of drowning in Victoria. Which is why the people you're looking out for should include you. Don't just look out for others. Know the conditions, know your limits. Authorised by the Victorian Government, One Treasury Place, Melbourne. Okay, so I don't know when, Paul, this one ran, but again, similar territory in the sense that it's it's personal responsibility, but it's also talking to family to look after family. Is this a recurring theme in the approaches that you're taking in Victoria? Yeah, it, it's really along the lines of it'll never happen to me. Um, you know, we, we the research showed us that, that men in that particular age, um, you know, that they were worried about, you know, their children and their family, but they weren't worried about themselves and, and believed that it couldn't happen to them. And that was really, you know, that, that approach um, taken with that particular ad. Um, and again, that ties in with, um, you know, men overestimating their, their ability in water, you know, which has been pretty consistent um, in the research as well. Yeah, I think in Victoria that you have sort of a reasonable scale of uh, budget for these campaigns. Are these campaigns evaluated? And what, if so, what are the insights that you're getting? And th does that give you an idea of future directions in this space? Yeah, look, the campaigns are uh, evaluated in government. In, in that particular one was, um, was only last season. So at, at this stage, we've got no evaluation on that particular one. But, but certainly there's... Um, the, the focus groups and, and, and the work beforehand gives us a pretty good indication on what we actually need to hit the target. Um, we do have a balance point where government is very keen for us to go the more hard hitting approach, where the industry is very, very wary of turning people away from the benefits of being in on and around water. So it, it's again, finding that, that balance point, you know, it's very much a um, knee jerk reaction. I, I think going too hard hitting um, at the detriment of what what is a, a, a huge industry. Mm. Yeah, that gives us a window into the challenge of the strategy, two challenges actually. The water safety strategy uh, does talk about this standardisation of messages because we don't have a huge budget for advertising campaigns and the like. Um, and we do quite often um, say the same things in slightly different ways. In different, um, in different territories and the like, but there's a little bit of an overlapping population. So I think the water safety strategy talks about trying to come up with frameworks for standardization of messaging in a way that doesn't stifle local creativity and the need for uh, state governments to have um, campaigns that are identifiable as state government campaigns. Um, I guess the second thing you're talking about though is this tension within the strategy of and Floss, keep, Floss comes back to this constantly. We, we, we want to have fun around the water as well. We don't want to um, constantly be talking about killing people's ideas of having fun and being out and about in wonderful waterways. Um, I do think there's a tension there between um, trying to reduce drowning, but as organisations wanting people to be wet and in the water and constantly enjoying it and building their skills. Um, Floss, how do you navigate that sort of tension between... Ooh. I don't think anyone signed up to hear me five times over and over again. I think it's been fixed. Um, but, but I was just saying that the balancing out of uh, talking about drowning prevention constantly, but also pushing that message that there are some fantastic facilities and fishing in the territory is a vital part of being in the territory. How do you, how do you navigate the two? I just... Um just working with the different groups and being part of their world. So what I realised took me, I don't know, probably eight years that all I kept trying to talk about was royal life saving all the time. So 
just tried to understand more of what was important to their group because everybody's, you know, got a great cohort, whether, you know, it could be kids safe or it might be Somerville or Amateur Fishing Association. And mm. instead of coming in as the fun police and put your, you know, stuff on and whatever, just understanding where where they were at and being part of their world. And um you know, like my sons were the only boys that had to wear life jackets on their dinghies and, you know, they only put them on when they seen me coming, um, but, you know, they got them on. Um, and, you know, I I think that it's just around you can do it, like you definitely can, you can do that, but you don't have to just um, be so hard-lined about it that it just annoys everybody no one wants to have anything to do with that so you know one of the things that we were um really great to uh, took us out of our comfort zone around COVID was like you know we we went and got some stand-up paddle boards and we had little community events at some of our water holes that were safe to swim in and you know, if we just had a pop-up tent for Royal Life Saving, we'd be begging them to come over, like, come here, come here, you know, whereas we had the stand-up paddle boards, we're like, have you ever tried these? Have you tried these life jacket? And get that there. And people just come in there to try it and talk about it and we weren't saying, you know, going in there. So I just think just to, to focus on the engagement, the fun and the understanding and... Mm -hmm. Um, and then have discussions with the leaders in their organisation if there is a big problem in that space so that then they can, like, listen to it from our point of view as well. So mm. I came in really hard and annoying in early days and now it's this way it's had a bit more, um, well, a lot more fun and a lot more understanding and, mm. you know, don't even have to say the words as much as well about the water safety. So that's the main that's the main focus. Yeah, like I do, I do. I heard someone say the other day that um, it was about making friends, um, <laughs> and it's easier to initiate change if you're friends with groups and people. So you know, in some respects, our our work is about making friends with lots of groups, um, irrespective of their interests, and then inculcating them with a little bit of drowning prevention at a dose at a time. So listen, thanks, Floss. It's been wonderful talking to you. Um, you, love yeah. the territory perspective and thank you very much Paul as well we're going to uh, move on to the next section so I appreciate your time um, a few people in the chat saying move on uh, Shane Baker is asking for a little bit more of a local perspective on approaches which is a great segue into the next section of the webinar uh, what we've got now is a, a local government approach or a couple of examples of how local government are focusing on reducing drowning and promoting water safety so what I'd like to do is introduce Nicole Edsel. Uh, Nicole is the Chief Operating Operations of, uh, Manager with Blacktown Council, and we've got Tony, Tony Blundell, uh, Coordinator Business Support, Leisure Services, Lake Macquarie City Council. Uh, welcome, Nicole. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, let's just do the same routine. How about you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, so I work for uh, Blacktown City Council. Um, I've been with Blacktown for nearly uh, 15 years. Uh, so my current role is um, Chief Operations Manager for um, Key Venues, which is a section of council. Um, we have about 11 venues and five of them are aquatics based. Um, so my involvement with um, drowning prevention has been motivated um, by attending the World Drowning Prevention Conference back in 2015. Uh, so at the time, a lot of the um, conference talk was about having strategies in, in place. Um, so that was pretty much the driving force on, on when we started to develop our um, drowning prevention strategies within local government. Fantastic. It's, it's good to hear those conferences are, are well attended and have, have some impact. Um, the conference in, was in Malaysia in 2015, um, and I think there might be a few Malaysians. So certainly there's a Singaporean on, on the web, webinar that may have been at that event, uh, Danny. So, uh, Tony, would you like to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background, please? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm pretty new to local government. I have got an Air Force background, um, was with the Air Force for 15 years, and was working out of uniform in, in the industry for a while and then um, saw an advert for project manager Smart Beaches 
uh, with Lake Macquarie Council and, and so it's pretty hard I had to turn away from, right? Um, be a project manager on the beach. So I inquired about that and applied and was successful and, um, and uh, was lucky enough to work on the Smart Beaches project with, with Lake Macquarie Council. And that really introduced me to uh, local government efforts and, and the drowning prevention world. And, and it's, it's amazing for me to be able to um, speak today in this group. So um, yeah, enjoying trying to use technology on the beaches to improve our, our water safety, but then also we've been looking at how we do that in our pools. Uh, it's great to have Nicole on here as well, because we've been looking at the Blacktown water safety strategy for how we might adopt that locally. And, um, you know, I think we'll talk a bit today about collaboration amongst local governments. It's important to be doing things at a local level, but it's also important that we don't you know, recreate the wheel and, and where we can actually get um, ideas off each other I think that's that's really the way forward so yeah thanks for having me great so we've got two two leaders from a local government er, two local government areas with slightly different geographic uh, boundaries and and communities and perspectives so that's why we've put you two together in this webinar um, I guess Nicole um, not everyone on the call will understand uh, Blacktown but it's sort of uh, metropolitan Sydney uh, outer western suburbs quite a diverse community um, and so tell us how you came to the drowning prevention strategy and what it's intended to achieve. Yeah so to give a bit of background on um, Blacktown area our population is um, over 395,000 um, so one of, we're one of the largest councils within uh, New South Wales um, and our population is made up of over 188 different birthplaces so um, our main countries of origin uh, the Philippines, India, New Zealand, Fiji and England. There's over 182 languages spoken um, within our uh, population. So um, pretty much a, a lot of our strategy is ensuring that we um, adapt to um, the, the whole community. Um, so how we came about our strategy is pretty much documenting what we do. Um, and also planning what we want to do um, for the future. So it's about um, having a committed approach to providing uh, safe environments within our aquatic and leisure centres. Um, and we're committed to doing that through preventable drowning um, strategic goals. Um, so they're focused around education, advocacy um, and support. Um, building um, partnerships and network building is important. Um, and obviously the environment and, um, and the technology becomes important as well. Oh. So, so oops, I, I keep going, right. sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. No, that's okay. Do you want to ask a question? I, or I, was, want... I was, yeah, I was going to, um, so, so I guess operationally, it's linking all of the assets and the operational infrastructure of council. Um, is, that, is that correct? And, but then also what was the, um, what was the councillor input into this? particular strategy? So we just need to make sure that our strategy links into to council strategy, which um, is minimising the risk um, to within, within the community. So, so that's the, the overall linkage and obviously providing safe um, community facilities. Um, so some of the in initiatives are asset driven, um, which Poseidon, is our drowning detection system that we use at one of the facilities. Um, where, whereas the other initiatives are more program based. Um, so we run a, we just recently ran a um, PIPS Safe Summer campaign, which focused on educating the community on our water safety um, messaging, um, using a cartoon strip um, to, to get that message out. Um, our Aqua Learn to Swim program is, is about, you know, teaching uh, the water safety elements within our Learn to Swim program. And then we also tap into the areas um, that need it. So one of the um, main ones that we did at the moment was an adult free program, because obviously um, that's the, the indicators and the ages that come out that are high risk. Um, we also try to use our partnerships with Royal Life and, and use a Keep Watch campaign to educate uh, the customers on, on active supervision. And that links into to the Australian Water Safety Strategy on, you know, that the main risks are 
the lack of supervision um, and obviously educating the community. Um, but I think for us, our biggest highlight has been, um, we rolled out a life jacket initiative a couple of years ago where we have um, 400 life jackets across our um, pools for free public use. Um, and we do feel that that initiative has actually um, assisted our pool rescue statistics. So we've seen a decrease in pool rescue statistics um, since we've implemented that initiative. Wow, okay, so fairly, a fairly comprehensive um, plan across multiple facilities within council and, and linking to the council uh, strategy. So most councils would have their own organisational council-wide strategy, so it sounds like it's important to hook into those. Um, thank you. Let, let's go to Tony. Tony, um, Smart Beaches in your introduction was a, was a key theme. Can you tell us a little bit about Smart Beaches? Yeah, so Smart Beaches was... Uh, funded through the federal government um, Smart Cities and Programs grant. And we actually partnered with Northern Beaches Council on, on that one as well. And the idea was to use technology to improve safety at the beach. And the key issue that we um, landed on, on addressing was really the application of council resources. So, um, you know, councils, I think, one of the problems we all face is, you know, we've got limited resources, limited funding. Um, there's only so much we can we can do with that. And so we're looking at how can we use technology to, or we've got our lifeguards at the, the right place at the right time, um, particularly at the beaches. Um, so uh, one of, we've what we ended up with was a, a couple of pieces of key technology that we've, we've um, been implementing it and using and firstly it's a, uh, using cameras to take photos on the beach to be able to estimate crowd numbers uh, across uh, every day of every day of the year and for us that's a really key piece of information because at the moment um, you know we can get lifeguard estimates of, of crowd numbers on the beach but that's only on the beaches where we have lifeguards and only during patrol times so there's a big missing piece there around you know, are people staying longer in the evenings during summer? Are they visiting during winter? And some of those unpatrolled locations, particularly during COVID where people are trying to spread out, um, you know, how, how are those areas being visited? So um, it's very hard to start pitching um, business cases for additional lifeguard services and additional resources based on sort of intuition and, and gut feel. And so having this sort of information for us really helps build that business case for you know, where, we, where we might need lifeguard services. Um, the other bit of technology that's been really successful for us is some GPS trackers on our, on our rescue equipment. And that takes a lot of the cognitive load off of our lifeguards where they don't have to be um, remembering to get their stats done after a rescue or in between rescues or remember exactly when things happened. We can um, collect that information in the background and, and then we can annotate that, that afterwards. Uh, we've also got some trackers on our various signage, so um, the flags, beach clothes signs, shark signs and, and blue bottles that allows us to, to track exactly when those signs went up and down throughout the day. And the idea is into the future, we'll be able to um, communicate that information more broadly as well. So communicate that out to the public too, to say, hey, this beach is closed or the shark sign's been there. Um, the other thing we've really done through through Smart Beaches and through our programs is um, trying to engage with researchers. So we've done a lot of work with the Beach Safety Research Group at UNSW. Um, and the idea there is, well, we've got these various initiatives, um, but are they, how effective are they? Um, and and uh, what evidence do we have to sort of, to, to back up you know, how, we, how are we going? And uh, you know, one of the difficulties at local government is we don't necessarily have those skill sets. And so if we're scrambling to try to understand how well things are performing or, or gain those statistics, um, that can be a real challenge for us, but it's the sort of thing that you know, research groups do um, as a matter of course. So partnering with, with researchers to, to give them interesting questions to solve and they give us interesting answers to um, guide, guide our future endeavors. Um, really helps us with that allocation of resources. So, yeah, it's been a, it's, it's been an interesting time. There's still a lot a lot to go. Right, and you so you've you've um, you've mentioned the magic word there to many people on the webinar data, um, and you've you've mentioned your uh, it's your research partnership, and I know there's some some people here um, that are involved in that. But 
Um, at the start, you mentioned a partnership with another council. So can you kind of give us a window into, in terms of how, and I'll bring Nicole in on this in a second, but how councils can work with other councils to solve problems? Yeah, I think um, something we've spoken about a lot throughout this journey is around focusing on all the things we have in common. Um, I think it's really easy to look at, well, you know, we're a bit different to that council because of this, that or the other, our, our demographics or our geography or um, whatever it is. But we've got so much in common with what we're trying to achieve and the problems that we solve. And, and actually COVID really brought this home for us. Um, all of a sudden, everybody had a real common problem to solve and we're all trying to solve it at exactly the same time. And, and so I actually had a silver lining for us where we're able to reach out to other councils and, and um, discuss some of these, these issues and work out, well, how are we, we're all trying to solve the same thing. So how can we pull some resources to, uh, to, to really move forward? Not having a, a local government background myself, I was, um, it was interesting to see uh, how split sometimes local government areas can be, but having been in it for a while now, you can see how that emerges where you, know, you are, you're responsible for your area and you're defined by a local government boundary. And, and it's really easy with so many different problems going on and, and so many complex issues to, you know, it's hard enough to worry about your area without worrying about somebody else's. But my experience has been um, reaching out to those areas and focusing on uh, what you have in common and allowing the differences to kind of sit in the background, but focus on, okay, what do we have in common and how can we work mm. together? And how could we, um, you know, get this done a bit quicker and easier? And it's proven really successful. So you can sort of understand the discomfort at the start um, around that, but it's been great for us. Um, we've been doing some, some work with other councils now as well on, um, you know, how we approach lifeguarding. And um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a really, Ben, big benefit for us in applying some local strategies by by you know reaching out to other councils and, and like I said as well we've been looking at the town um, pool strategy uh, water safety strategy um, to include our pool stuff as well so um, yeah that's yeah, it's been really good thanks, for us thanks Tony let's go to Nicole Nicole um, Greater Western Sydney is huge right it's um, it's almost well it is a city in its own right and it's you know the size of Brisbane in many respects. Um, from Blacktown West of Sydney. So is there an opportunity, is it already happening for councils to unite and share lessons and work together to try and impact on water safety outcomes in, the, in Western Sydney? It's definitely uh, food for thought. Um, I, I do believe the, the councils work on a higher level, um, probably not at an aquatics level as such, um, but there's definitely an opportunity there um, to... Um, build those partnerships and and collaborate as Tony was saying so yeah probably something to look at for the future okay um very good um and so you but you your part of your initiative is technology um and so you Blacktown was one of the first councils in Australia um to initiate the Poseidon system um are there other areas where you're using technology to to reach audiences or communicate with your community uh, so a big part of um, our drowning intervention strategy is understanding the type of incidences and the impact that it has on um, our community. Um, so the data analysis is quite important. Um, so tracking all of our incidents and accidents becomes really important and the type of incidents and accidents or pool rescues that are occurring um, becomes important. So. Um, we have a system in place to do that and that allows us to analyse the data and then obviously, um, you know, we'll assist in the future strategies because we can adjust the strategies based on the type of incidences that we are, um, are having. Um, and Tony mentioned COVID. I'm just wondering, given your role with, uh, with ARI New South Wales, and I know we've been in almost weekly calls through COVID last year, I'm just wondering... Um, Tony's identified and Paul Shannon also identified a coastal impact of COVID. What, what are the COVID impacts on the aquatics industry? So obviously COVID had a huge impact um, across the, the industry for um, Blacktown. We had to close um, our venues, so reopening 
um, was exciting and um, and trying to build that business back is um, is really important. So getting the trust um, from the community to come back um, is, is has been the focus over the last um, couple of months. Um, so yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, we we don't end up back in that scenario where we where we do have to close the doors. Um, but it did give us an opportunity to to reset and um, and to focus on the programs and the the community information that we we felt was important and sometimes gets lost in the day to day operations. So um, even though it was it was horrible to go through that process, a, a reset and a reopen has has been um, a good part of the process as well. Yeah, look, I, I think it's been difficult, particularly in, in, in Victoria. Obviously, they've been uh, closed and locked down far longer than, um, than in any other state. So I think we should be mindful of um, the COVID impacts on water safety going forward, not only in the coastal location, but also across the border population. Um, you know, there's, there's potentially a generation of kids that um, have had their contact with swimming lessons broken as a consequence of those closures. And, and we're just not yet sure whether those kids will return to the pool at some point, um, notwithstanding the, the adults that we're using the local pool for its uh, wonderful health social uh, benefits. So um, thank you for that. Um, and I just had another question for, for Tony before we, we move on. Um, you mentioned lots of partnerships there. Can we reverse that and ask you the question about what we, we being the, either the Water Safety Council, um, those organisations whose core purpose is water safety, drowning prevention, perhaps the, you know, the academics in the room, what, what do we need to do in order to orientate ourselves to the opportunity of local governments being more engaged in water safety and water safety outcomes? Yes, yeah, really good question. And um, I don't know if I've got potentially the experience in local government to be able to answer that really well. Um, but with with the experience I have had, I think um, local government does need to be more open to um, reaching out to, to, to solve problems collaboratively rather than just being you know, focused on their, their own area. I think, uh, and so I guess what I've seen potentially in some areas is um, local governments can feel like things are being done to them rather than with them. And that you know, uh, initiatives come out, um, changes are made, or, or uh, things are happening, and, and local government wasn't necessarily um, able to be involved in the development of that. And so now it's like, okay, well, this has happened, but we have to now uh, implement a lot of it at our local level, or we're responsible for mm. local implementing it. So I guess the more that we can do it with local governments uh, and with those those partnerships, rather than doing it and then presenting it to them. Um, the better and local government I think's definitely got a role to play in on that space to say well it's very difficult to engage with every single individual local government entity when you when you're trying to um, mm. do something on a, a state or a national level so you know the more that we can collaborate and and partner to provide united fronts across local government areas um, the better you know we can engage with these larger larger issues to be able to implement them at a local level so um mm. i guess it's trying as much as possible to do things with each other rather than to each other to each other yeah okay good good point nicole have you got a view on what we need to do to be more effective in working with local government um i think it's just the the communication is important um and having those connections within uh, each local government becomes important as well um, finding out um, what each local government's, um, particularly within the aquatics um, venues, um, what their pain points are and, and how, um, you know, this can assist, it becomes really important. Thank you. Listen, thank you to both. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, Nicole. That's been really interesting and really informative. Congratulations on your individual initiatives and, and congratulations on the I guess you've sort of opened up to have a talk amongst yourselves about how you can perhaps collaboratively work as uh, as as across council. So um, thank you very much. We're going to move on now, but um, have a good day. Enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so yeah, the. Um,
Monique here is moving me along. I'm recognising that there's 20 minutes to go in the webinar before we finish, and I was a little bit over time last time. I hope you enjoyed that section. I do think um, local government is the, the quiet achiever here, and certainly they're doing a lot um, to impact on water safety outcomes. And um, perhaps they've been involved in some places, and in some places perhaps they're not. Um, some research that um, Amy and Richard and uh, Stacey and I uh, released just recently, we kind of realised in an inland context that the who owns the water is vitally critical to water safety outcomes and quite often that overlaps with, with councils. So let's go to community-based programs. Um, this is, uh, again, the pinwheel or whatever we're calling it now. We will change the name of this uh, very, very soon, I see. Um, but so the idea here is that people could localise programs that... Um, it doesn't matter whether you're running a state government program or a council program or even a program operating in a local pool, that there would be a way to use this pool and to single out the areas that you're focused on. You might have a program that's focused on older people and that involves uh, swimming and water safety education as a risk factor um, that might sort of principally be angling towards improving the, 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 the ability for the local uh, population over the age of 65 to use their boats on, on the ocean, perhaps. So we're going to talk about um, these ones are very cultural examples of how people are activating water safety uh, outcomes at a community level. Let's move on and introduce our next speakers. We have Sarah Scars, and Sarah is a solicitor um, with diversity and inclusion as her specialisation, and she's involved with an organisation, the Aqua English Project. And we have Ashol Madong, um, and Ashal is an inclusion coordinator, swimming and water safety with Royal Life Saving WA. So two great speakers working locally. Um, firstly, can I welcome you, Sarah? Um, Sarah, would you just introduce yourself um, briefly and, and the project that you're working on? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Sarah and um, I'm one of the co-founding directors for the Aqua English Project. We've been um, in operation for about 15 years now, predominantly in Southeast Queensland and um, to the north as well. Um, so we're having a good time with that. We've outreached to about 33,000 culturally and linguistically diverse people across that, that time and stage. And we mainly target adults over the age of 16 with 70% of our participants unintentionally uh, being women as well. Fantastic. We're gonna, we're gonna dive deeper into the Aqua English project in a second, but Achal Madong, would you introduce yourself? Yes, as Justin mentioned, uh, my name is Achal Madong. I'm the Inclusion Coordinator, Swimming and Water Safety for Royal Life um, Saving Society WA. I look after multicultural programs, Aboriginal programs and special access, um, Swim and Survive programs uh, in the metro area. So I've been at Royal Life for two years now and it's, yeah, it's been well so far. Fantastic. Well, well welcome to you both. I, I, on the first webinar, we talked about um, the multicultural community specifically, but we talked about it at a very high level in terms of the objectives of the water safety strategy. I think having you both here gives us an opportunity to, to, to look at this from the community's perspective and, and some of the activities, the things that are working at a community level and some of the pitfalls, the things we need to look out for. Um, so Sarah, can you just flesh out a little bit more about the, what makes the Aqua English project tick? Because I do, I do think you've found an interesting entry point or entry points into water safety and communities in Queensland. Yeah, so um, we came with the recognition that um, for us to really look at whether it's drowning prevention or social inclusion, to get um, grassroots community programs growing, going, we needed a holistic approach. So we've often found ourselves as the middle organisation, obviously between the groups that represent our multicultural communities, whether or not they're um, English language institutions or NFPs um, that work on settlement services. And then of course the aquatic industry itself. Um, and quite often the conversation between those two, um, you know, isn't um, as fluid as it could be um, or readily understood between both parties. So we find ourselves mitigating between the both and trying to come up with a program that's either four, six or eight hours that incorporates, we call it the four E's now. So um, engagement, how we engage community, uh, how we empower them, empowerment, how we integrate swimming with essential English, that's our third E. Um, and then a subsequent consequence of those three things can often be, and I want it to be, um, employment. So seeing some uh, more diversity within the workplace 
um, that way as well. So that's us in a nutshell. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so just going to the uh, to one of the E's there that the English two E's actually. Let's go to English and employment and talk about yep. um, how important the, the link between those two sort of the initial training in English and swimming. It seems like an odd pair, um, but also the employment I think is something that's really important. Yeah. So um, you know when we started Aqua English, I, I listened to the other speakers. We we're very hardline. It was about drowning prevention for us, and we came in very hardline um, as a, an engagement or recruitment strategy. And, and that's since evolved um, to more of an in social inclusion strategy. So what barriers affect uh, entry to aquatic centres um, or being able to safely swim? And and the barrier that comes up the most is English. Um, and there's a lot of hidden language and subcontext and meanings around the swimming pool. Um, so when we finish in a centre after four, six or eight hours, it's like we were never there. We would like to know that participants can communicate effectively with the front desk and say they would like a concession pool entry or to enrol their kids into swimming lessons or that they know where the deep and shallow end is, or they actually know what the M in 1.2 M for metres means. So we have to really work on empowering that way um, and using the language that we use around the deck, um, which can be very um, ochre <laughs> in some particular regions. Um, so heavy accents and heavy tones on deck as well. So um, yeah, English is, is vital. And then of course, if we're talking about employment, if I wanted to see our bicultural aquatic assistants turned into water safety officers and getting their lifeguard and, and, and swim teacher qualifications, I need to know that they can communicate effectively and do um, risk assessment and, and all of those things that they need to to be in any workplace, not just our workplace. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how English fits and we get to work really well with the ESL teachers and TAFE and work a little bit more on integration of this strategy into curriculums as well. So, um, yeah, it's always a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, so, Achel, I, I, I'm assuming you were nodding a little bit through Sarah's uh, discussion. Can, can you tell us a little bit about the programs that you're working on and how you go about that? Yeah, so our, our approach to dr drowning prevention is we look at swimming programs and water safety education is one project. We don't separate swimming lessons and the rest of the stuff that we do outside of the water. Um, we have a multicultural steering committee. Uh, in that multicultural steering committee, we have community groups, uh, service providers and aquatic centers that are members. We work together to co-design and co-deliver um, the women's program, men's programs, children after school, uh, swim and survive lessons. We do water safety talks in the community, uh, first aid training uh, to empower the community to be safe in and around the water. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we do, we work in partnership with our, the aquatic centers and the communities to make sure that those pr programs are tailored to each community. Um, and, and how important is it to tailor the programs to each community? And what are some of your successes in that area? Well, we understand that each community group has different barriers to participation. So our role is to act as um, we eliminate those barriers, whether it's cost, um, language, uh, transportation, whatever the cost, uh, the barriers to participation participations are, that's our job to remove those. So some of the things that we've done in the past, uh, for example, our women's only lessons, um, some groups are okay to do their sessions at a local center uh, without the worry of who's around, but some community groups may want private access. So we've worked with local councils such as the city of Stirling's um, Leisure Park Belga to run women's only night swimming where we have the whole center closed for two hours. We have female swimming instructors. We have female lifeguards, um, female deck supervisors. And yeah, through through each uh, through our discussions and meetings with each group, we're able to find out what their needs are. We work with the aquatic industry um, and the aquatic centers to make sure that we tailor each program to meet the needs of that group. Uh, just because somebody has uh, you know special requirements or barriers uh, or religious or um, cultural beliefs, that's not a reason for them not to participate. Um, we. In, 
one of the things that we encourage or we we repeat to our our community is that you are part of this community you should have access to your local services just because you have um reasons why you can't participate in regular lessons it's not a reason to stop or it's a reason why you shouldn't ask for for lessons so empowering them to speak up and to come to us if they have any problems and for for our community um our industry as well educating ourselves so that's why we have that multicultural steering committee um we work mm. we do cultural awareness training um, and we yeah empower and train our staff to to be able to deliver these programs. Um, fantastic! Like I, I do think that the idea that you're working with um, removing individual barriers yep. um, is a is a key point, very specific to to each community. And and it sounds to me like you are you working individual by individual or community by community or generically across the industry. What's the what's the key there? What's working for us is the fact that we've built strong relationships within um, with different communities across the state. Um, so within the metro area, we have um, we work with service providers that um, work in highly um, high cold population areas or high ab um, Aboriginal areas. We work with community leaders and community groups. So a lot of these communities will have an association and within that association, they have their own leaders that look after different things. So whether it's a, a females group or a men's group or um, a youth group, they have different leaders within these communities that um, have high priorities in, in certain areas. Um, but swimming is uh, it's an area that we find a lot of people are interested in but without the information um, of where to go and how to access the services, they, they, they obviously cannot participate. But through the, the relationships that we've built with the community leaders, we're able to promote swimming and water safety um, to the members of those communities. Um, and we work with yeah, service providers. Great, Achal. Uh, Sarah, I'd like to ask you, um... Like I, I do think one of the challenges here is is sustainability, um, funding and sustainability. So where do you sit on on that challenge, really? Whether whether these programs only happen when there's funding available and there's a constant tussle to try and find funding available, versus making that change more sustainable and less reliant on um, on ad hoc approaches to funding. Um, we have been strategizing that for about a decade now. Um, <laughs> Um, the, one of the, the critiques sometimes we get when we apply or repeatedly apply for the same pot of funding is that I have to show something different, but the needs are always constant because the new user groups coming in, uh, migrants, new arrivals, refugees and humanitarian entrants, their needs are essentially the same. They come in as a, a lower level English speaking and uh, non-swimming. So I, I can't change that. But um, Look, it has to be holistic. The approach to this strategy and the approach to a grassroots level implementation is holistic. And for me, that's the recognition that, um, you know, I, I need all angles, um, all levels within the water safety and swimming context um, for support. And um, we would be un unsustainable without um, our partnerships with council. So we have really good relationships with councils, Gold Coast, Logan, Brisbane, Lockyer Valley, Toowoomba, Cairns. Um, and that's where the, the sustainable programs happen for us. So to give you an example, under the Active Parks Initiative, and I'm, I'm sure that there are similar ones Australia-wide, there's access to free and low cost um, programs. And traditionally it was just for parks. And we had to lobby for a long time to convince people that a council pool should be considered a park. Um, and now we have permanent funding, uh, particularly in Brisbane, for eight weeks of every term for a very low cost adults only swimming lesson, deep water running class and aquarobics class at three venues across Brisbane. So it only costs that participant pool entry. And what we've been able to turn those programs into are feeder programs. So when we do get the bigger hits of funding to um, address significant needs that align with migration trends and where people are being placed, we actually have a feeder program in existence to push them into. And they might stay on that feeder program because they know that we're there and they're comfortable for another year. But um, a lot of the times now they're moving off of that feeder program and, and remaining um, 
you know, very active community members within an aquatic perspective. So for us, grassroots initiatives with council and partnerships with councils and having feeder programs in existence um, that will catch anyone coming in in those programs that we get broader bouts of funding from. And then obviously as a project now and as an NFP, we're exploring um, other earned income revenues to keep things um, ticking over that way as well. So always something happening. <laughs> Uh, Charlie, is funding a challenge in Western Australia? And how do you go about creating a sustainable effort? It, it is a challenge, and I do agree with what Sarah has said. Um, yes, um, they may say, well, we funded this before, but it, there's always a new group of people that need that service. So um, we find that, for example, a lot of our participants, some of them have been here for more than 15 years or more than 10 years, but have never had um, access to swimming and water safety. So through the funding that we received, um, a lot of our programs are subsidized. So participants do pay a small fee and we find that small fee um, actually is great because they do commit to the program. They see that they are contributing and it, it's an introduction or just um, a transition to um, swimming lessons in their local community. So they do understand that swimming lessons are expensive and yes, they are subsidized, but um, through the small, uh, I guess, the small fee that they pay, they do see a value in the lessons and, and they feel like they are part of the community or part, part of the, the program and, and that they are, they, it's not, they're not receiving a handout, I guess. Um, thank, thank you very much. There's lots of positive feedback to you both in the chat. Uh, uh, lots of people inspired um, about the programs that you're, you're running and, and very, very encouraging. Um, so I'd like to thank you both for joining us. Achal, I'd really like to thank you because you learned about your participation today at about 7.30 last night. So um, we apologise for the late warning, but we're really pleased that you could join us today. Um, so thank you both. Thanks, Achal. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, great job, like two really inspiring people working at a community level. Um, on the screen is probably the slide I wanted to show a little bit earlier. It sort of gives people a sense of what we were thinking when we developed the water safety strategy collectively. Lots of we's in that group, not just uh, me and a few, but I, I don't think we've got this right yet, but our idea was that the, um, that the wheel um, could be contextualised down to local programs. So, for example, some of the work that Ashol's um, uh, working on in relation to water safety initiatives for multicultural communities um, could be really easily tailored and connected to the strategy and really a, a really grassroots contribution to supporting the strategy. We've got a little bit of work there to do, I think, um, but that's quite exciting work to work out how we can connect what is a, a national strategy um, to local and community groups and all of the wonderful efforts that they're um, doing there. Um, so that brings us really to the conclusion of uh, this third webinar in the Australian Water Safety Strategy webinar series. Um, some of you have been asking to see um, the videos and the videos now are available for webinar one and webinar two online and there's a link that will appear in the chat. Um, you can find them somewhere on the Royal Life Saving website. Um, what uh, Monique Sharp's done um, um, has um, split them into, you can watch full hour and a half of webinar one, if you'd like, or you could, it's been split down into sections as well for ease of access. And we'd certainly encourage you to review them, to share them with your colleagues and friends, share them on social media, uh, tag the people that appear in those uh, webinars if you, if you can. And that's sort of a wonderful way of uh, going beyond the 100 or so people each webinar that we've reached. Um, the other thing that we'll do is early next week, um, we're not quite sure what to do next. Um, we'd like to keep uh, the weekly webinar series going, but we think we'll actually pause and reflect and collect some feedback from you all um, just to, to look at what sort of interests and ideas. Uh, what we've done is is very broad brush um, review of the water safety strategy. There's probably an opportunity to do a deeper dive into some of the very specific areas. And I do think at some point we've got to roll our sleeves up and, and get into some of those media issues and create some change. Um, traditionally in a, in a COVID free world, we would be running symposia and workshops and getting around the country working uh, side by side with many of you. Um, that seems like it's not realistic in the near term. So we, we we're looking for feedback in terms of how we can activate this strategy and get people working together to try and initiate um, a range of sort of activities and initiatives and research and all sorts of great things 
um, particularly as we lead into summer. Um, so, so today I'd like to uh, close by thanking all of our wonderful speakers. Um, and we had eight today. Um, so I thank them for their contributions. It's been really insightful and informative. Uh, we've had around 75 to 80 people on the webinar, um, which is great. Uh, the chat's been really busy. There's a few people uh, from international and lots of very familiar faces. So thank you for engaging in that way. Um, and I'd like to also once again, just thank uh, contributions, the people that made the webinar series uh, possible. Um, Monique Sharp, uh, the Royal Life Saving Office, Chris Groneman, Alison Mani, um, and also Will Kuhn um, have made some significant contributions over the three series. I mean, in the background, we've had lots of people helping out, out to promote. So um, I thank you once again, look out for that uh, survey and your feedback is very welcome. Um, we are absolutely committed to, to listening to what people would like to see next from us. So um, thank you very much and, and have a great day. And don't, uh, don't forget to look out for those videos and share them with your friends and colleagues. Um, thanks very much for your attention um, and have a good day. Thank you.